five degree days um, to get from bloom to maturity, what do we call maturity? In this, in this uh, uh, ditto here, it's 20 degree bowing or bricks. And uh, the data, I, I don't quite understand what's going on myself because for years the data indicated that, for example, for Thompson Sealess, well, here's, this is probably a good example for Thompson Sealess. They didn't vary by more than about 100 degree days, although this is, well, this is nearly 200 degree day difference between the two. But um, since I had these on hand, and we had talked about degree days, <coughs> excuse me, and the differences in bud break of different varieties, which is probably as important as anything else on this handout, I thought you might like to have it. But it does show quite a difference from year to year, just these two consecutive years of 67 and 68, in the amount of degree days in order to ripen a variety. But these, these two years were quite different. If you look at the second column, you'll see, for example, that by time of bud break in 68 or 67, we only had 91 degree days, uh, degree days accumulated by bud break. But in 68, we had 180, almost twice as much heat accumulated by time of bud break, a difference between those two years. So. Uh, this information is rather confusing, but uh, it's here for what it's worth and something for you to look at. Excuse me. Um, okay, now last time we were <clears throat> talking about uh, uh, laying out the vineyard and we just touched on this idea of spacing. And I want to go back over to again for just a few minutes because say we ran out of time pretty fast. And the point is that um, work that has been done in California, and we'll discuss it here in a moment in a little more detail, has shown that it does that you get the same production per acre on vines once the vineyard area is covered, regardless of how many legs it stands on. That's the way I describe it. For example, the winter vine. Uh, you've been told, produces nearly a ton per year from the one vine. And that occupies something like a thirtieth of an acre. So if you put 30 such vines on an acre, and once they are mature, then they should produce as much per acre as any other system you've got. But you've got that problem of waiting until you fill in all the space. So this is a big problem of really wide spacing, is a waste of area until you get the uh, area fully covered. But uh, there's no doubt about what wider spacing, both between the rows and between the vines, is economical in cost, in the original cost. Obviously, you take fewer stakes, uh, a smaller number of trellises, and trellises are expensive. And I used to give this a little example, and I guess I will. Uh, that if you consider a block of land, and let's just say you start out here at the edge and go in about roughly 80 feet, obviously then if you've got uh, uh, seven feet between the rows, seven foot middles we call it, seven foot middles, then you have to have uh, seven times 12, you have to have 12 rows to go through roughly 7 times 12 is 84, so you have to have 12 rows of, of, ter of uh, trellises in order to cover the area. If you go to 9 foot spacing, then you get down to using only 9 rows. <coughs> or if you go to uh, 10 foot, of course, then you get down to 8. So just in the space of that short of 80, 84 feet area, you can cut the number of trellises you've got to build from 12 down to 8 which is a third saving in the cost of trellising. And roughly a third a cost in saving of the vines that you plant. It used to be that, and it can still be if you're planting in, in a, a new area and not worrying about variety selection or virus-free or patented varieties, what have you, uh, vines may not cost much. You can plant your own nursery, 
and uh, plant rootings that may only cost you in total t uh, labor and everything, maybe 10 cents a piece. But as those of you know who've been going into a little bit of planting recently, some of these potted vines, virus-free and patented, are costing you 75 cents a piece. So um, it pays then to consider whether or not you can have wider spacing. Wider spacing, fewer vines, fewer trellises, fewer stakes. Grape stakes alone today are costing 50 or 60 cents a piece. So when you, when you figure uh, spacing and figure the difference in the number of vines per acre and the cost of those vines and the difference in the stakes per acre and the cost of the stakes and the cross arms and the wiring for trellises, then you really get down to the point of really considering a wider spacing on cost alone. That used to be our sermon. But that was, before, that was when land was uh, $500 an acre. Today, as you well know, in Napa Valley, it's around $3,000 an acre. So maybe it's better to invest in a few more uh, dollars per vine, I mean, uh, dollars for more vines per acre and more stakes and more trellises per acre. If your original cost of your land is 3000 and it costs you 1000 to put in uh, sprinkler irrigation to protect it, there's a $4,000 cost to start with. So what's another $100 plus or minus on the cost of vines? Something to think about. Okay. Have there been any studies on the minimum spacing? Well, I'll get that in a moment here. Okay, so I will get to that. All right, then I want to get that idea across. That, uh, that I want to get across the idea of cost that you must consider the pluses and minuses of cost. Because really that, when I get through it, all I'm gonna say this morning, that's what it boils down to, is a consideration of cost per acre. But the cost of cultivation is less. If you've got wide spacing, you can go through with bigger equipment, make fewer passes. If you're paying a tractor driver $5 an hour, and he can drag a disc that's uh, 10 feet wide instead of four feet wide, obviously he's gonna cover more acres in an hour. Uh, I talk, talked to you about the harvesting last time when I said that with this close spacing, you often have to pick the, vi uh, the boxes up and carry them at least usually uh, 10 vines up or 10 vines down to a middle or an avenue so that they can be picked up by truck. With a wide spacing that we have in California, the 12 foot spacing, you can drive through and pick up each box right at the base of the vine from which it's picked, which makes for a whole lot cheaper picking and the ability to use uh, women and children for picking if they're available. Okay, now, and also this whole matter of uh, power dusting equipment and spray equipment I told you about, uh, you can get in easier and do a much better job. With these narrow plantings, frequently by the middle of the summer when you really need uh, insect and mildew control, the vines have grown so close together you cannot get through with equipment. And the first question somebody's going to ask is, well, what about using an airplane? And airplanes are fairly good for big, large acreages. But if you've got 10 or 20 acres, or if you're over in Napa Valley with trees and telephone poles and TV aerials, you can hardly get in with an airplane. And, but helicopters have worked fairly well in Napa Valley. They work pretty well because they blast that blast of dust down right into the vine and beat it up. So it works fairly well. Now, uh, what about some spacings in the world? Uh, I showed you some of those slides of Germany. I told you that they look like bean plants rather than grapevines because a very common spacing in much of Northern Europe is about three feet by four. It's in meters, but it's roughly about three by four. And you can imagine how much hand labor is involved in uh, that type of spacing. Uh, they're going gradually to wider spacing. In other words, uh, what we're really drifting toward is that our California system is drifting to a little more narrow spacing and the Europeans are drifting to a little wider spacing. We're gonna have a meeting of the, of the mine somewhere here. But at three, at three or by four or something of that type, 
you, you wind up with about over 3,000 vines to the acre. In Champaign area, according to my notes, uh, they go as high as 4,000 plants, vines to the acre. As you go farther north in France and Germany with a shorter growing season and therefore the weaker vine growth, they plant the vines closer together. And as you go farther south, on the contrary, as you go farther south into central France and then the southern France and then into Spain and Portugal, the vine spacing gets farther and farther apart. In part because of the longer growing season, the more vigorous vine growth you can get in southern France and in Algeria. But much of the wide spacing in Spain is because of lack of water and poor soil. So they space them farther apart. So that you go anywhere then from a maximum, let's say, of about 4,000 vines per acre down to a minimum perhaps of um, uh, what we would grow in California with our Almeria of 12 by 12. Remember, that's the overhead spacing, which is 144 square feet per vine. So this would get down to something like from, say, in your own notes or in your own mind, just say that we have spacings from, say, 4,000 down to 400. And that's a good figure to use. Okay, now, uh, we have done work. Well, one comment I want to make then before we go any farther, because it always takes about five minutes to explain it in class, that Winkler states in the textbook that 8 by 12 spacing gives you 410 vines. And every year, if I don't tell a class, somebody holds their hand up and wants to know why. And you know, he sneaked that into the new textbook too, even though I chewed him out of <laughs> all these years. Um, what he does, he doesn't take and figure the, the square footage, 43,560 43, square feet, and divide it by 96. To get this 410 vines, he takes 20 feet around the outside of a 10-acre spot block for turning space and avenues and so forth. And then the figure he gives you of 410 vines per acre is based on the inside of that 10 acres. And that's where he gets 410 vines per acre when it should be 453. Or just figure roughly 450. And I told him, I said, let's leave that out of the new textbook because it takes me five minutes every year to explain it to the class. And I was reading the, uh, the proofs the other night and I nearly exploded when I saw that somehow I'd overlooked it and he sneaked it in again. So it's in there again at 410 vines per acre, which is wrong. Course. I told him anybody can do their own figuring on avenues and driveways and so forth. Let's tell them how many vines per acre. But he got, he got, he got away with it, and I'm going to get him. <laughs> Boy. Because he says in there then, yeah, I know it. Well, I'm going to tell him right <laughs> this morning. Uh, at 8 by 12 spacing then, you get 450, roughly 450 vines per acre. At 6 by 12, which is the other spacing we recommend, you get 602, or call it 600 vines. So at, at 8 by 12, you get 450 vines per acre. At 6 by 12, you get, call it 600 vines per acre. So this gives you some idea then of what your costs are going to be on the spacings we recommend, because basically at the present time, these have been the two main spacing we, we've recommended. For weak vines, six feet apart in the vine row, and for vigorous vines, eight feet apart in the vine row, with 12-foot middle so you can get through this equipment. But I say that's been, that's the old style, and you'll hear, you talk to Dr. Leiter, myself, uh, Mr. Casamatis, and so forth, and you'll find that we that all of us are willing to hedge a little bit now. We're willing to go, uh, I'm willing to go to say six by 10 or eight by 10. The 10 foot between the middles, whatever this, this depends entirely on your equipment. And as we go to more and more toward mechanical harvesting, 
you have better check for the latest models and styles of mechanical harvesters to see what is the minimum distance between the rows that you can have. Because this really gets down to what it's all about, that it, you can't vary the distance within the vine row very much. For a vigorous variety, eight feet's about your minimum. And for a weak variety, six feet within the vine row. Uh, but the distance between the vine rows can, can depend entirely on the type of equipment that you've got and what you're going to do about it. Because in this vine row, as you know from 116A, uh, the spacing, whether it's six or eight feet or more, depends on the vigor of the variety. And you can take a vigorous variety and plant it four feet apart, the vine row. No matter what people try to do, they do this. And uh, in the 5 p.m. session, I told somebody, you can't do that any more than the old Chinese used to bind their children's feet up so that they wouldn't grow big and they'd have small feet. <laughs> and all they did was uh, make them malformed. If you take a vigorous grape uh, variety and plant it four feet apart, how are you going to control the vigor? How are you going to keep it in that four feet? Prune it real hard? What happens when you prune it real hard? <laughs> you get more vigor. So see, so you're caught. So you've got to leave the space in the vine row, depending on the vigor. But between the rows, you can usually you know, adjust this according to the equipment that you're going to have to work with. Now that's a pretty basic principle. So we think that some places you can go down to 10 feet, although I hedge and say 11 feet, and Leiter says, well, what's one foot? Well, you multiply it clear across a section, a uh, 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 full mile, and that one foot difference, it's, what, 9%, gives you uh, that many more rows at 11 feet. But uh, uh, I don't think we need 12 feet between rows, my big point. On most of even in our Thompson seedless, and even with our sloping cross arms and trellises and what have you, I think 12 feet's a little too generous. That we could get by with 11, but we are going down to 10. Okay, now uh, Dr. Winkler has carried on quite a uh, he carried on a big experiment in Napa Valley. Getting out of your question, in which he compared spacings all the way from six by eight with all the various combinations you can go through, uh, down to 12 by 12. There's three, six, nine spacing arrangements. And he carried this on for about, let's see, from 48 to, for 20, for 40, 50, for nearly 20 years from the time the vines were planted, and kept the yields over all this time, and measured the yields per vine, the yield per acre, the weight of the clusters, the sugar content, and so on, and got no real differences, except, as you might expect, in the first couple, two or three years, the six by eight gave you a little higher yield because this 12 by 12 wasn't taking advantage of the space until it filled in. So he was arguing uh, greatly in those days for wide spacing, as you might gather from what I've been saying. But the final conclusion, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, is that it gets down to a matter of cost. Uh, you've got to calculate your, your land costs, your vine costs, what you figure is going to be your cultivation costs, your labor costs, and then decide on the spacing, at least between the rows. But within the vine row, of course, it depends on the vigor. Okay, now, uh, any question further than that on spacing? Yes. Yeah, this is okay. I have it down here, and I forgot to mention it. The fact that this trial was carried on at Oakville in Napa Valley with no irrigation, and of course, this puts a, this puts a, a bias on the data completely because what would happen if you had complete adequate irrigation? You see, with six by eight spacing and no irrigation, you run out of water relatively soon. 
at 12 by 12 spacing and no irrigation. Each vine has a whole lot more water. I just said that about Spain. I said that's why they space them, the vines farther apart because of poor soil and lack of water. So we now have two or three. No experiments, Mark. Uh, we've got one here at Davis spacing and one at Oakville and one and one over where? In Alexander Valley, In Alexander Valley where the El Alexander Valley trial will be irrigated. So that we'll see what this does to total production. What difference does this Well, I think you'll get a little higher production uh, with a closer spacing under irrigation. But the question once again is what's the cost going to, what are the cost factors? Uh, of course, in Europe, uh, they're close together there, but partly close together because of the, of the cooler climate, the weaker growth, and the fact that they can put them close together. We do not believe, another one of the old European stories, that by planting the vines close together, this forces the roots to the surface, and therefore they, get, uh, they take advantage of more heat from the sun and produce better quality fruit which, believe it or not, you'll read about. Just as I say, you can read about the idea that in the Bordeaux area, they think that that gravel soil they have gives a gravel taste to the wines. Uh, so uh, uh, these are some stories which are, I don't think have any basis. But if any of you really want to read the complete summary now of this paper by Winkler, we cannot hand you out the, uh, the reprints. In fact, I don't have, we don't have that many. But if you look up Winkler, the paper in the American Journal of Enology and Viticulture, um, volume 20, Number one, number one, it's a quarterly deal, number one of January 1969. And you can read a complete final summary of this 20-year study. But that's not required reading. That's just for those of you who might be interested in reading more on the details. Uh, along with the work of getting the yields and the productions on, he had a graduate student who uh, worked, uh, came over from Switzerland and spent an intensive two years trying in every way that we can uh, with all the uh, taste testing and analyses and color readings and what have you on all the methods that we can to see if there was any difference in quality of the grape or the wine produced at these different spacings. And he was unable to show the slightest effect due to spacing on wine quality. So this we argue is part of the support for wide spacing. OK, now we, we, we're, in a we're going to space as far, so far apart as possible. Uh, remember, we're still talking about how to avoid losing money. And you want the rows in a vineyard area that you, we're not going to talk about laying out vineyards. We're going to do that out in the field. But if you're going to lay out a vineyard, obviously you want the rows as long as possible. Because if you start out down a row with a, a tractor and a disc, you don't want to spend half a quarter of your time turning around. So the longer the row, the, the better and the, the cheaper. I am told, although I haven't seen them, that there's some rows in, uh, in Kern County that are three miles long, where, where these big corporations have planted three sections consecutively. So you got to take your lunch with you before you start out on, on the tractor before you get back. So, but uh, I haven't seen them, but I'm, I'm told that, they are, that there is one area where they planted three. Remember, these big corporations are pl uh, plant a section at a time. A section's a square mile. And if you, of course, if you put them in tandem, you've got three miles of rows to go over. But that's a little bit of a, an extreme. But you do want the rows at, so long as possible. But uh, in California, where irrigation is required, the length of the row, or at least the length up to a breaking point, 
depends on irrigation requirements. Now, if you're using sprinklers, of course, this is different because it depends then only on the pressure you've got and the water supply. But if you're using fur irrigation in some of these real sandy soils, you can only irrigate about 300 feet. Otherwise, you're watering down instead of out. It'll soak in. So you've got to arrange these, uh, the breaks between your avenues or your cross avenues to fit in with the texture of the soil for irrigation purposes. And then uh, we get around to direction of the row. See, there are lots of little details in growing grapes. Um, in Cal, uh, of course, where irrigation is required and where you're going to irrigate by furrow, the direction is, is already uh, dictated by the slope of the soil. But we're real lucky in California because if you start from the Sierra over here and then come across the San Joaquin Valley to the, to the uh, coast range, it isn't quite that extreme. <laughs> but uh, I want to exaggerate a little bit because we're lucky and the, and the slope goes across this way from east to west. So it makes it fairly easy, e even though I told you originally the land wasn't as smooth as people think it is, still the general slope is from the east to the west like this, so that your irrigation is pretty is easy to set up so that you always irrigate from the east toward the west in most cases. Well, what's good about that? Well, one of the big important things is on uh, planting rows for uh, drying grapes for raisins because you want the rows to run east and west. And why is this? Uh, So if you've got the grapevine here and here, if you run them, of course, uh, what they do is they pick the grapes off of here and put them on a tray over on this side, this being the north and this being the south. Well, if this is, it, now we're at the east, see, we're in the morning sun, and the morning sun comes up, of course, and you can get a sun onto these, this tray of grapes to start drying pretty early. If it's August right now, the grapes would already be in the sun. And if the sun goes on over toward the west, you get the full greatest amount of sunlight hours on your raisin tray if the rows run east and west. But now if they run north and south, I'm over here now at the east and the sun's coming up and the sun's gonna have to get up here to about nine or 10 o'clock before it can come over and hit the raisin tray that might be over here. And then by about four o'clock, it's in the shade again. So you can grow raisins in California, fortunately, because we do have so much sunlight, so and you can grow them, the rows that run north and south. But you've got a strike against you. So you want it so that the sun comes up in the east, hits that early, and stays with it till late afternoon. And aren't we lucky that the land slopes in just the right direction to give us the east-west planting of the rows. We got a lot going for us here. And besides smart growers, we got good soil, right directional land, what have you. Okay, uh, but suppose you're planting wine grapes and suppose you're planting them at Davis. You got another little point about direction and to take into account and that's when. And I think if I ask you real fast which way is better to plant the rows, you'd always answer wrong. Is it better to plant the rows so that the wind comes whistling between them like this? These are the two rows and the wind's coming from that direction. Do you want the wind to come this way? Or do you want the wind to come at them this way? <laughs> you want the wind to whistle down between the rows. <laughs> I always have to pull out my comb and show this. All right, we got cordon trained vines. That's the only, only reason I have a comb. No need for anything else. <laughs> um, see, if you plant the rows like this with those cordon trained vines and the shoots come up like this, the wind hits them this way and each one prote uh, protects each other so that you don't snap them off. But turn it this way and then put the wind at it. Plunk, 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 so you can knock them off. So if you're planting in a windy area and you don't have to worry about furrow irrigation and you're not making raisins, 
then plant the rows so the wind whistles down between them. Yes? If it goes down between the rows? I would think that if there was any advantage from mildew, it would be better to plant them crossways. You know, they get wet and then the wind comes right through them like this to dry them out early and quickly. But I guess the mildew isn't that bad a problem. It's more this breakage that we're talking about, especially on cordon trained vines so forth, and even on cane prune vines when the shoots go up. It's, it's better to have them so that they're in line like this. I sometimes use the example that if you're sitting in a football stadium and everybody's getting excited about who's making a touchdown, you rock like this, but uh, you, you, you don't fall over because the next guy keeps you from falling over. <laughs> uh, why is Davis opinion set up so they all flow through the vines? Well, here I think it's a matter of irrigation. Yeah. Um, See, I said, see, we have to irrigate here at least twice so that the controlling factor in California with fur irrigation on row direction is the slope of the land, no matter what your other factors are. But if we go to sprinkler irrigation, then you can plant them in the right direction. And uh, I wanted to touch a moment on trellis because you're building trellis this week, but... Uh, I think I'll leave that mostly for field discussion and also for uh, Dr. Cleaver when he starts talking about carbohydrate uh, balance and production and, and leaf exposure and so on. Now, one thing I did not touch on last time, I'm trying to tell you how to plant this vineyard like it's the last lecture. Uh, I said that sometimes if you have nematodes, you need to fumigate, bef uh, fumigate before you plant. And I said we talked about DD and all these other things later on. It helps sometimes to fumigate, even if you don't have nematodes, if you have a bad weed problem, because you can kill this, you can kill the Johnson grass and Bermuda pretty well by a very good fumigation. But it's expensive. But the one thing that I did want to touch on, because um, it comes up quite often in uh, telephone calls and so forth, is that I bought this 10 acres of land. And it's never been grapes at all. It's coastal county land. It's been in pasture with a few oak trees in it and so on. Do I need to fumigate for what we call oak root fungus? And we'll talk about that when we get to diseases. But oak root fungus is a, is, is a misnomer because it, it attacks a lot of different crops. But quite often in some of the old vineyards in the coastal areas, you'll get spots maybe a quarter of an acre, maybe the size of this room and so forth that the vines are dying out from this, uh, this root fungus. And it's most often associated with oak trees. And people say, well, shall I go in and spend $400 an acre to fumigate to get rid of any possibility of oak root fungus? I'm putting 4,000 an acre into this vineyard. Should I go in and spend another $400 to fumigate? And I s tell them that if it's virgin land and it's not been in grapes so that you're not worrying about nematodes and what have you, not to fumigate because rather than spend this is 10 acres rather than spend four thousand dollars fumigating the whole 10 acres in case you've got a little spot of uh, oak root fungus over here why not just go ahead and plant the vineyard and then if you find out you have oak root fungus in a small spot go in and be ruthless and tear out a half an acre or so and then fumigate it intensely and start over it seems to me that this is a more economical way to approach it. Okay, because if you go in, you, you put in $4,000 when you don't know that you have oak root fungus at all. Why not go ahead and plant the vineyard and then if you have to pull out one acre and fumigate later on, you only spend $500 or something for one acre. Of course, you've got to start over with your vineyard. So it's an argument back and forth. Uh, the big thing that some growers come at me with is that I can't get somebody to come in and fumigate just one acre. They either do 10 acres or, or they tell you we got other business to do or you get somebody else to do it. So if you've got a possibility of oak root fungus, you've got to take that into consideration too. 
But uh, I still think it's better just to uh, plant and then worry about it later on. Well, that's a problem then because he, if you put in permanent set of sprinklers, you've got to pull those out. If you put in trellis, you've got to pull all that out and so on in order to fumigate properly. Or do you? Can't you just fumigate and kill the vines that are still partly alive and uh, leave your permanent set of sprinklers there? And then, uh, well, then you've got to rip out the one plant. Now that'll all be hand work. What's that? You spend your $4,000. spending your $4,000. <laughs> Well, I would still plant and worry and let oak root and worry about the oak root fungus later. Maybe you have a better root stock or a better variety by the end of planting those spots. <laughs> okay, then we get around to planting, and I think I touched on this before, but somehow I had the feeling I did not. How to plant? We talked about rootings versus cuttings and so forth. But you lay out this vineyard, and you can lay it out to uh, uh, just greenhouse pot labels by marking the spots and then pull those up and plant the vines where your pot labels are and wait a year to put in your stakes, which is one way some people do it. Other people uh, plant by taking uh, little one inch square sticks that are 18 inches long and marking the spot and then plant against that peg, they call it a peg, and then when you mound the soil up, you still leave enough of the peg above the surface of the soil so that you don't run over it with a tractor. And then pull it out next year and put in your stakes. The old way used to be to, to, uh, to lay out the vineyard and put in your permanent stakes before you ever start to plant. And that's been the tradition in California for, since grape growing started. But that was back when you got redwood stakes for about, uh, well, at a very low cost. But the point is that the redwood stakes you got in those days were good, solid, heart redwood that would last 40 years. So it didn't make any difference if you put the stake in this year or next. But today, the quality of the stakes has gotten to the point where you're lucky if they last 15 or 20 years. So you're throwing away 5 or 10% of the life of the stake if you put it in before you plant because you don't need it that first year. Furthermore, they've gotten so expensive that the cost of them for a year before you need them can add up quite a bit if you just pay an interest on the money. And if you're on a shoestring basis of putting in a vineyard, then you're far better off to plant to pegs or to labels and wait one year before you have to invest in the stakes because of the investment cost and because of the percentage of life of the stake that you lose by leaving it a year there when you don't need it. But we will plant the stakes out here in our own vineyard, I think. What's the new one uh, that stays now? What's the uh, one? Well, the art, what's your question? What's the cost? Or? They're getting competitive. They're getting competitive, but steel stakes, I think, are still more expensive. Just Yeah, yeah, this is usually done on large scale. If you're going to plant that three miles of them, you're not going to hammer them in the way you people are. You're going to use <laughs> <laughs> cheap university labor, <laughs> student labor. Uh, Paul Lasker, yeah. where are you? What are steel stakes now? Do you know? And I think steel ones, somebody told me, I think they're about 70 or 75 cents. But uh, they're still sort of experimental because there's several designs and uh, uh, some of them are round. You'll see some out in the vineyard. Some of them are angular. Some of them are half circles and so on. So uh, they're still sort of an experimental stage and still fairly expensive. The one that really can afford them is Kaiser Steel out over there in Napa Valley where he's got all, of course, steel stakes. <laughs> But a, a beautiful vineyard, too. OK, now, any other question on planting? Because we're going to change the subject entirely now. Yes? Um, what, do you, what do you do if you have a non-square plot of land? How do you? Just try to make the rows in the longest direction possible if you can. That's all I know. There are very few square vineyard spots that you're going to find in the coastal counties in particular. But just try to make them the rows as long as possible. 
That's the, that's the big thing, provided you're going in with sprinkler irrigation, which you would be doing in the coastal counties. If, if your rules are so long, aren't you going to have another problem to harvest here? Well, what way? Well, if you have to go, you may also go to the and come back, you know, Well, when, when we talked about the three-mile rows, remember, that means in the straight direction because you've got to have brakes, I said, because of the irrigation length or so that you can get in. And uh, this may be three miles, but it's three miles this way or what we call uh, roadways or avenues across ever so often. And the length of this depends on, if you're running irrigation water in furrows, the length of it depends on how far you can run the water uh, economically. If it's real sandy soil, and you may not be able to run it more than two or 300 feet. I worked in Florida for a couple of years before I came here, and I tried to, and I was in charge of citrus nursery work, and I couldn't even run water the length of this room in those Florida sands because it just goes down before it goes on. So I had to sp sprinkle everything, even in a nursery, I say the size of this room. What most of you don't know is that Florida is nothing but a big sandbar, and uh, and uh, the. Highest textured soil down there has about four milli equivalents per 100 grams of nutrients. So that, uh, uh, and the highest point of Florida is 300 feet. So it's nothing but, a, I say, a big sandbar, and you, you have to sprinkle irrigate if you're going to irrigate at all. Okay, enough on Florida. Uh, the next subject we want to take up is one that some of you saw covered in the old exams, and that's summer pruning. So, uh, You'll want to go back to the chapter on pruning and pick up those six pages or so that I told you to skip during the winter time. And go back and read those six pages or so on summer pruning. And obviously summer pruning, as a definition, will mean the removal of any vegetative part while the vine is actively growing. And I emphasize any vegetative part. Uh, thinning of the fruit is summer pruning. So we're t going to talk about the various types of summer pruning and what they do to the vine and why we do it for this, the rest of this lecture and the next one. Now, um, if um, summer pruning is done very early, such as this week, see that's removal of vegetative growing parts. If summer pruning is done very early, it, it really has about the same effect as winter pruning. And you had that pounded at you enough to remember what it means, that it decreases the overall capacity, but concentrates the growth. And therefore, it gives you better vigor. And that was the basis of the question that you got on the winter vine on the final. And, that, and uh, uh, the question was a little tricky, and when I said, uh, when the shoots were, what did I say, six to eight inches long. If I'd have said four to six, then it would have been a completely unfair question. But as it was, it's what, the, what you guys call a sneaky cook question. And uh, on where I said that you leave a two-bud spur and let them get six to eight inches long and then pull one of them off, what does that do to the vine? Well, when they're six to eight inches long, they still have not used up their share of the stored carbohydrate. So that when you pull that one shoot off, you've done quite a mouse to sort of a modified winter pruning, leaving reduced number of shoots and a little more stored carbohydrates for the shoot that's left. Now, if it's done very early, it's the same as the winter pruning. So I should reword that question and say when the shoots were four to six inches long. And then there would have been a, a completely fair and non-confusing question. And that's the way it'll, it'll be from now on. Okay, so summer, but summer pruning, as you go later and later on, I said six to eight inches. Now, if you get out to 12 to 18 inches long and then pull off those shoots, the summer pruning obviously becomes more and more depressing to the vine because by the time the shoots are 12 to 18 inches long, they've used up all their share of the carbohydrates from the mother plant and haven't had time to put back any. They've just been dependents or parasites up to about the time they're 12 to 16 inches long. And then you pull them off, and then you get a weakening effect because, as I say, they have taken 
their share of the plant reserves out of the overwintering vine and have not had time to put any back. That's one reason why it's extremely depressing. The other is that when you do most of the summer pruning, the average human being, when he, when he does, pulls off shoots in the summertime, won't pull off a shoot that has clusters on it. He pulls off shoots that don't have clusters on them. If he's going to have to thin out the vine, he'll pull out the shoots that don't have clusters on them. Normally, or at least a higher percentage of them will be pulled out that way. What's that doing? You pull off leaf surface, but you don't pull off fruit. So you reduce the leaf to cluster ratio. You don't increase it, you reduce it. On a general average uh, summer pruning, that's what you will do, that you will pull off more leaves than you pull off clusters, and that this will tend to depress or weaken the vine. See, in dormant pruning, when you take off potential leaf surface, you can't help but take off fruit with it. But uh, in the summertime, you can be selective, and that's, that's, that hurts. So the later on you wait to do this summer pruning, the more and more depressing or weakening it is on the vine. And it's the reason why we're going to discuss summer pruning now, because next week we'll go out and do some, some uh, thinning or uh, uh, crown suckering and so on while the shoots are short. And then we can discuss cultivation and other uh, weed controls later on. But since this is a depressing effect, you don't just go out and, and blindly do uh, shoot removal for just because your father did it and your grandfather did it and so forth. You ought to know why you're doing it and have a reason for taking off green leaf surface. And we're going to talk about, all right, now the easiest way to... Uh, do this, and we've got a couple of minutes, is at first is just to make the simple statements of why we do it, and then next time we'll take each one of those simple statements and expand it. So the first reason why you might do it is to train the vine. Remember you saw this in, the, in that slide series I showed you. So it's to train the young vine, to, to uh, put it into the permanent framework that you want. And this means disbudding, uh, topping, uh, suckering, pinching the shoot growth, what have you. Okay, another reason is to uh, open up the vine so that you can get in with sulfur dust and uh, spray material and so forth. This is called crown suckering, and we'll discuss that in some detail. And I'm trying to give these in the order in which they're... And the, another one would be to expose the fruit for, color, for better color development. And then to uh, uh, alleviate or reduce this wind damage that we were talking about earlier by pinching the top of the very rapt rapidly growing shoot, it slows it down for a while, lets it harden up. And then finally, uh, not finally, but one more here, to reduce the water requirement of the vine. If you're growing a vine in a non-irrigated area where you really have minimum water, of course, leaf surface is what uses up the water. So if you can take off part of the uh, leaf surface by topping the vine, taking off the leaf surface and slowing down the growth, then you slow down the water use. And uh, I had another reason here somewhere. And one which we, we sometimes talk about, but I think it's a very weak one. I've take it, tried to take these in order of, from the most important down to the least important reason is to increase the shade on the fruit by topping the vine increase the shade, that sounds contradictory, but if you take a long single shoot with the fruit exposed and cut the top off and let the laterals come out, you make an umbrella type shade, or at least you're supposed to. <laughs> okay, now I think that's, that's your main six points of why you might do summer pruning. Uh, we do leaf removal, uh, but that's to, uh, again, to get exposure of the fruit, and uh, we'll discuss each of these in detail next time. Okay, 